Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 152, we're going to talk about the 6P, 1P, Dash EV, Power Tube, and the KitFet headphone amp Progress. That's right, we've made some progress. <laughs> well, we're just about ready to release to the test builders the universal phono preamp. And now, well, our general rule is we only work on development work on one kit at a time, right? Mm. So just as we were nearing completion, you started on this yeah, before well, we were finished well, we're, the phono. <laughs> we're done the build of the phono. Now we're doing the build videos. So uh, that's freeing me up to do a bit of development work. Oh, okay, side. fair enough. So that's your story and you're sticking to it? Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, you may wonder why we're talking about a power tube that's virtually unknown in the West, though it was probably made in large numbers in the Soviet era. And in Class A triode mode, can probably only output about 1.5 watts. Well, three reasons. First, we can still find good quantities of NOS, NIC, that's new old stock, new in the case, all made by Svetlana. That's the original St. Petersburg manufacturer that made the famous Wing C EO34s, among many other great tubes. Second, because we need a high quality power tube for our kit headphone app that's resumed development, as we said. And, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. Yeah. And lastly, because I had a feeling, now this is going back quite a while, that these tubes would sound amazing. And in the version one builds of the prototype kit headphone app, I was proven correct. Wow. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Uh, and in fact, that that headphone amp, the prototype, sounded so good that it spurred me on to buy one of the best headphones ever made. Yeah, we've increased our collection of, of very high quality headphones. And spent a huge amount of money <laughs> in the process. Now, we, I could have spent 10 times as much. I, When we got into this, I had no idea that headphones were such a thing. Well, it, they can sound absolutely amazing and you know in the the world we live in where everybody has a smaller amount of space to work with and probably a lot of neighbors it's nice to have a good pair of headphones for doing your listening and it's a unique listening experience it's nothing like sitting down in front of a good high quality stereo system like we have in the music room it's it's just such an intimate listening experience. Oh, and you get pretty much perfect stereo separation too. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got, you know, balanced hearing. 2020 hearing? I don't know how they do that. Actually, I had my hear my ears professionally uh, tested by my sister-in-law and she said, you've got nothing to worry about. For an old guy, you've got amazing hearing. Well, let's try and keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Charles, why don't you spend a few minutes taking a look at the data sheet for these wonderful tubes and then let's, we can do an unwrapping and we can do a little show and tell of some of the examples we've got. Yeah, okay. So, one of the neat things that we often see with Soviet tubes is that they like to include the data sheets with them. Now, with the larger power tubes, you'll often find them wrapped around the tubes themselves. But with the smaller tubes, you'll find a big stack of these in the tops of the cases if they um, if they thought to include them. It doesn't happen all the time, but you'll often find something like this, which is really neat. Of course, it's all written in Cyrillic Russian. So if you want to get any useful information, you either have to know what you're looking for or you have to be able to translate it, which isn't too hard. But online, there's typically um, a translated data sheet. Somewhere. Yeah. So on the on the better data sheets from the Soviet era, you'll see actually the Cyrillic on the left and on, on the right hand side, you'll see the equivalent English translation. Yeah. So they were nice enough to include translated data sheets like that, but you can still get a lot of information on here. And typically data sheets will give you the pinout of the tube. They'll give you the maximum values or the maximum ratings, and they will give you an operating point where they like to be run. 
So, just a quick look at this guy here. What we have is a, a great logo. A great logo. And Which you actually don't see that often. No, but we've got them on all, on all these beautiful tubes. That great wing C. And so this is a 6.3 volt uh, heater power tube, which is really common with the Russian tubes. I'd say 90%, maybe more, use 6.3 volt heaters. They like to standardize on that. And if we flip it over here, we can see our maximum plate ratings. And this is actually an interesting point right here. These ratings define our on-center maximum plate values and our cutoff values. Not every data sheet is going to show that. And not every data sheet is going to label things correctly. They might say um, absolute maximum ratings or maximum ratings or design center maximum or something to those effects. And you've got to spend a few minutes interpreting what exactly the engineers were saying like, when they wrote it down. Exactly, because the maximum at cutoff is completely different from what's, what is considered the design center value. And the other data sheets that you can find of this tube don't have this 430 at cutoff, and they don't define the uh, the maximum on-center value as being an on-center value. So that's important to know. And that's, for us, that's because to get a clean 1.5 watts in pure class A, we're going to push that 250 volts a little bit, aren't we? Yeah, we're gonna go a little bit above this design maximum, which isn't typical, but through experience and research with the tube, we know it can handle it just fine. Yeah, and the reason why uh, many Soviet tubes seem to be centered around 240 volts um, or 250 volts maximum is because they were the, their their main supply is 240 volts AC, and they wanted to use the least expensive, simplest transformers they could get away with. So it was probably which, a one to one. Which is a one to one, yeah. which means they're going to have 240 volts present on the plate side. So, mm -hmm. so you'll see that it's fairly common in a lot of their tubes. So another interesting thing about the 6P1P is that it is essentially a 6V6. Uh, really the uh, earlier version of the 6v6, the 6v6 GT in a small bottle. And we actually have a version by Svetlana here. This one was made in 1954. It's a beautiful old tube. And they made all of these with this black coated glass, which is common with the vintage uh, 6v6s, especially the RCA 6v6s. And of course, RCA set up the original manufacturing four Russian tubes. So that's not surprising. They probably actually tooled up the 6v6 just before the Second World War got or, going. Or, you know, gave them the uh, the data on how to make it and they, they copied this manufacturing process. And of course, the RCA black uh, coated 6v6 is a must have for, yeah. for guitar amp owners. Yeah, they're and, beautiful tubes. And the interesting thing is, I think we have quite a few of these Svetlanas. We do. Yeah, we have quite a few. And we have some that I, I believe are branded national as well, uh, but they are all the same tubes. We have quite a few that are new old stock, actually, which is pretty hard to find. Yeah, and I'm surprised. You know, we, we sell a lot of premium 6v6s to guitar amp owners, and nobody's latched onto the Svetlanas, which, hmm. you know, if, if I was going for a 6v6 today, I would snap those Svetlanas up. But no. anyways. Yeah. So because we've got coated glass here, we can't really show you the plate structure on camera. I've gone in here with a really high powered light just to see if I can figure out what it looks like. And it really does look like this plate structure. And they've just shrunk the bottle down around it and maybe tucked in the edges a little bit here. And so what this ends up being is literally a 6v6 in a nine pin bottle. And they're really nice looking little tubes. They have a great glow to them whenever they're lamped. Now and this is the EV version, which which means that it is a ruggedized long life. Yeah, so EV will stand for extended ratings. And the data sheet doesn't show any difference in the in the specs for it, but typically means it it was higher it was built to a higher standard and it's able to handle more abuse, as we've been able to tell. And normally an, an EV tube from the Soviet era will have uh, coated pins, right? Mm -hmm. Or tin pins, which is a nice plus because yeah. the standard pins are just brass. And you can see there's absolutely no corrosion on these at all. We haven't had to clean them up. Yeah, they that's are, the way they came looking, out of the yeah. box. Speaking of out of the box, 
Oh, you've got one all wrapped up. So this one we actually haven't opened yet. This came in a case lot that that schematic actually came in from. And this is how we, we often find these tubes in the case. Oh, it looks like somebody has marked something on this one. Maybe that's a factory note from the inspector. Oh, it could be. And these ones were made in 1991. And the exact same construction, we've compared uh, a number of different versions of these tubes going all the way back into the 70s. And, you know, typical Svetlana, they found something that worked and they didn't change it at all. They're the same tube all the way back. So there's one that just came right out of the sleeve. Beautiful clean pins, great label on it. They're just really nice little tubes. And they glow beautifully too. Yeah. So we have lots of different versions of them. We have plenty in stock and you know, they're still available to buy for reasonable prices. A lot of them were probably made and warehoused whenever they were replaced by solid state technology. I'm not sure what they use these in, but it was probably some sort of home console or TV or something to that effect as a little power output tube. Or a tabletop radio. Yeah, maybe something like that. Which the 6V6 was a very, going way back to mm -hmm. the 1940s, the 6V6 would have been a common, it's a common tube, believe it or not, in, in early car radios as well. Yeah. So maybe that's what they were using them. Yeah, we find a lot of them uh, branded uh, GM Delco. Mm -hmm. So this is the power tube that we intend to use with the headphone app. It is the one that we use with the earlier version one of it. And now we're on the version two prototype, which isn't something that we normally do with these amps, but the earlier one was built on a chassis that really wasn't made for it, and now we have a new chassis that's designed to take all the parts this amp is going to need. So and we also learned a lot from the version one build as to what that, what the a, a better layout of the prototype chassis. Oh, would absolutely, be. yeah, and we also learned that these tubes sound amazing, and we wanted to keep working with them. So that must mean that you've actually started the build. Yep, I have. So let's grab the plate and get it over here. So let's start off on the bottom here and you can see, well, maybe you can't see, this plate is huge. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit here. It'll be the largest chassis that we've built on other than um, our power tube tester. All right. Well, I can't get it all in frame here at one shot, but you can see I've started on the power supply section. We've got, of course, our dual mono setup that we like to use in all of our amplifiers. And that's gonna help again with stereo separation and sound stage and sound stage it's well with headphone sound stage i don't know if it's that much of, of an importance but i think given how how immediate the the sounds the stereo separation was in the version one i think uh, i'm happy with staying with the dual mono yeah we discussed switching to a to a single power supply for both sections but we decided to stick with this for now yeah and you can see on our we've got our, our new dual output power supply boards in here but we don't have any of our dropping resistors in place instead what we have are these leads sticking off and this is something that we do during our development process do you want to talk about it a bit well we're just going to we have uh power a power res well we actually have a whole bunch of power resistor decade boxes and all they are is uh, just a, a bunch of really large huge resistors on switches so we can we can dial in our voltages l basically live as we bring the amp to spec and it makes such a, a difference for development speed not having to find resistors and clip them in and make sure we have a good connection with them and yeah i mean we have to have an idea as to what the value is going to be to start with yeah but we start basically we'll start the amp cold and then we'll start to slowly bring up the tubes to uh what we're aiming for spec wise yeah and then once we know what we want to work with we can take out these leads and put the correct resistors in place yeah it saves so much time fooling around soldering and unsoldering and clipping in and unclipping how about why don't you flip it over and show off the top plate because oh, it's heavy already and it's not even half built <laughs> Yeah, we put two big handles on it because... Yeah, here, let me get that in frame. Yeah, we got... Those are actually the handles I first used on the power tube tester, and I like them so much. It makes such a difference being able to move a piece of gear that's a little bit bigger 
around. Well, especially when we don't want to scratch up and mark up the plate. This just, I mean, it helps keep it off of whatever surface we're working on and it just makes it easier to, to handle. Okay, well, we've, we've got three premium headphones that are waiting for a chance to play again. Yep, yeah, and we've had a huge amount of interest in this amplifier uh, since we first started talking about it. So for everybody that's been waiting patiently, we're working on it again now that the phono is, is on its way out the door. Just about. <laughs> Just about, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for doing all that work, Charles. All right. And we had a, a few things come in this week, but something you really wanted to show off. Can you grab those? There we go. What have you got there? Oh, yeah, we found some more tongue saws. Let me zoom in so we can take a look at them. This is... Of all the tubes, premium tubes, these are probably the hardest to find in any quantity. And the annoying thing about the Tungsol 6SN7 GTBs is that some of them are noisy. So mm -hmm. we lose some to noise. Some are low testing or really the sections are off. Which is unfortunately really common. And we end up, I think we return more tongue cells than any other tube to sellers. Oh, we, we probably return more than we keep. <laughs> yeah, we actually got kicked out by one of the wholesalers that we bought thousands of dollars from. And uh, he said, Jim, I can't afford to be selling to you anymore. Every, every second tongue saw I send to you, you're sending back. And I said, well, if it's a bad tube, it's a bad tube. You yeah. can't send that to a customer. We're not going to sell it to you guys. Anyways, the, you know, I, I have two 6SN7s, two manufacturers that I get behind big time. One is Sylvania. Sylvania has this warm, rich mid range that's it's um, the best examples are almost to die for. Really similar to a Muller DL34 mid-range, uh, the XF2 series, and the Tungsol EL... Uh, <laughs> Not the EL34. <laughs> I got the EL34 on the brain. And the, and the Tungsol GTB version. And there's a the standard bottle version and a taller bottle version. They're both, as far as I can tell, basically the same tube. They sound very much the same. Yeah. And actually, there's an earlier GT version that has the mouse ears um, that people really like a lot as well. And they are all basically in the same sonic family, very much the way Sylvania made tubes. And um, this is about as close a matched pair of tongues as you're going to find and you're high find. testing too they don't tend to test this high and uh, yes that's true the interesting thing about a lot of tongue saw um not only 6SN7s but other uh triodes is that they tend to test about 10 percent lower than the normal spec mm -hmm. i have no idea why because tongue saw considered themselves sort of a premium manufacturer back in the day and they were known as having one of the best labs for doing um uh, chemical analysis and development work. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big difference with the Tungsol GTBs is the level of detail. They give up a little bit of that mid-range warmth, but the detail level is just to die for. It yeah. goes deeper and deeper in the tube. Now, to hear that kind of detail in your system, everything has to be top-notch. And um, our our listening system is at that stage. In fact, it's gotten to the point where we hear all the flaws in the recordings. Sometimes really busy recordings can be a little bit harsh to listen to because of it. Yeah. In fact, most recordings just don't, we just don't put them on. Yeah. <laughs> or if we put them on, we kick them off. Mm. Which reminds, we've got a big record show coming up tomorrow. So we're really hoping to find yeah. some fresh stuff to you know, do tests on. And maybe even show off to you guys. Yeah, we can't put everything uh, onto the YouTube channel because some of it is uh, copyright excluded, which... Um, which means even though we don't monetize the channel, we can't even have it on there. So. Yeah, it's, it's just not allowed. Uh, all the... Um, all of our favorite German label, I've already forgotten the name of it, um, uh, with Manfred. Uh, I've, geez. Oh, well. I don't know. It's your favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know. It's not coming back to me. But um, some, some labels, interestingly enough, all of the Miles Davis recordings on Capitol Records, they're all available. Now, we, ha we have to give up the royalties 
all of the royalties off of the video. Mm -hmm. But we don't monetize the channel. But YouTube still reserves the the right to advertise on it. Yeah, yeah and take and take the royalties and pay off uh, the the artist, mm -hmm. uh, which is fair in my opinion. Yeah. Well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And we can reach most of you with a flat rate $20 shipping. If you're in one of those really difficult places where uh, postal theft is very common, we have to track. It might cost a little tiny bit more. So it's best to give us a contact and see what's going on with your location. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. And there's some codes you can use to save some money. And a lot of you have been using a hidden code that is actually quite easy to figure out. Well, you keep talking about it. <laughs> well, you know, times are tough for a lot of people. I like, yeah. I like to see discounts coming in. It means people are watching the channel. It's, it's sort of a big thank you to everybody who's part of this, oh, yeah. our community. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.